Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here. I want to talk about how you can use your diet to really heal your adrenals and to talk about some of the core concepts in the Adrenal Reset Diet. And for starters, I want to make a differentiation between adrenal fatigue and what I've called adrenal stress. Now, adrenal fatigue is a term that many of us think about, we're aware of the symptoms of that, and it's a good placeholder term. But I don't like it because it's a little bit misleading. It implies that the adrenals are fatigued, <laughs> that they are weakened, that they are compromised, that they cannot do something that it would help you if they did. And that's actually not the case. There are diseases in which the glands are rendered unable to make hormone, and that's different. So with adrenal fatigue, the glands may be underactive, they may be overactive, but it's not because they're broken. It's really because the body is trying to control them to help better your chance to recover. You know, you've got a car that's sputtering, you don't want to drive it fast, you want to drive it slowly. So that's what's happening, and I call it adrenal stress. And if we were starting over from scratch, and I didn't care about using words that were cumbersome or long or awkward, we'd probably call it hypothalamic pituitary adrenal dysregulation, or HPAD. And there's a lot of literature supporting that that's what it is we're talking about, that it's a real phenomena, it impacts our health, and we can change it by positive means. So what gives rise to adrenal stress? Well, short answer is living now in the 21st century gives rise to it. There's so many cues that our bodies need that were part and parcel of life, life in the past that we're now separated from. You know, we don't wake up to sunlight. We don't go to bed by candlelight. <laughs> we don't have temperatures that get colder at night. You know, we have a diet that's higher in fructose, lower in fiber. We've got a lot of random chemicals that we're around. We've got higher levels of mental, emotional stressors that we're dealing with. So all of these things collectively create this phenomena of adrenal stress. And adrenal stress is a very real thing. So it can shorten our lifespan. It can expand our waistlines. It can cause premature, fast aging of our skin and our immune system. And it can just wreak havoc upon our brain and our mood. And it's also a big factor in triggering thyroid disease and triggering a poor response to thyroid autoimmunity. So we want to manage it. We want to make sense of it for sure. And we can't always change every variable that makes it apt to happen. You know, all those things about living in the 21st century, we can't just like wave the magic wand and be in a perfect world in which none of those stressors are affecting us. So I put a lot of thought into how it was that we could reverse this. And it was important to think about because all these health factors are real, but also there's a direct effect that this has upon body weight. You know, cortisol, we call it a glucocorticoid. It's a blood sugar regulating hormone. And that's kind of the leverage that I use to fix it, but that's also part of how it causes problems. When we've got too much of it or we're making it the wrong times, we go into a storage mode and we start just holding on to calories in the form of visceral fat. And those same calories had things been working differently. We could have burned them in our muscles, in our brain. We could have done cool things with that. But instead, we store it around our organs, and this stuff creates inflammation and harm for our bodies. So remember that whole blood sugar thing. So cortisol raises blood sugar. There's a natural cycle to where you have a meal, your blood sugar is higher after your meal, it goes lower afterwards. And if you don't eat for a while, you theoretically would go into a coma and ultimately die if your glucose went too low. Because it's so important, our body has checks and balances and ways to deal with that. And one of the first ones is cortisol. So you make a burst of cortisol, your blood sugars back up again. And in terms of the survival need to maintain your blood sugar, problem solved. But the drawback is now you've got a whole lot of circulating cortisol. So you've got all the same complications you would get from a higher stress response. So the main remedy that I've used to help with this is a simple concept I've called carb cycling. And here's how this works. So remember that thing about blood sugar dropping, cortisol rising. So we can use that to our advantages. In the diet, we have carbohydrates, proteins, fats. Uh, fats have pretty minimal effect upon cortisol, neither good, neither bad. Protein has a very small effect, kind of like carbohydrate, and then carbohydrate has by far the most dramatic effect. So what I did with this dietary plan was I had the first meal, I should back up, 
the goal is to have your cortisol highest in the morning and lowest at bedtime and lowest throughout the night. So to achieve that, I devised the first meal to support higher cortisol. This is a lower carbohydrate, more good protein, healthy fat based meal. The next couple of meals, I kept proteins and fats the same, but I raised the carbohydrate content because by raising carbohydrate, you lower cortisol. And this is one of the pitfalls about low carbohydrate diets is cortisol gets too high. High cortisol blocks thyroid hormone conversion and you end up with too little active T3 and also yeast overgrowth, many other issues. So you want some carbs, but if you were to have them early in the day, you would push down your morning cortisol and you wouldn't be very alert, you wouldn't be very mentally sharp. I've heard some say that if you are going to consume carbs, have them early so you have time to burn them. And I guess that makes intuitive sense, but the drawback is that, that eating and burning, there's a big time gap between those two processes. It's not so much putting gas in your car to where you could be about to run out of gas, you, know, you pump in five gallons and you're burning it right now. Your body's not like that. So the fuel I'm burning right now as I'm speaking to you is mostly fuel that I got from yesterday's food, especially yesterday evening's food. That's the main thing that we make into glycogen, our body's main energy source. So you do want carbs when you can burn them, but when you can burn them is more so evening. You do a better job making glycogen out of them than you do in the morning. Now, having said that, many people have had a diet that's just more food than they need, and they've added carbs on top of that at nighttime. You know, if I'm not doing things well, I, I get random cravings at night, and I want to munch on all kinds of things, so I understand that. But it's not the same thing to say that just adding carbs at night is completely harmless and you can never get problems. Any time of day you add any kind of extra food, whether it's carb, fat, or protein, you can have weight gain from that. But overall, if you're on a good amount of total food, a good calorie target, more of the carbs at night can serve you in many ways. And there's actually a big study done on this, apart from mine, in which they gave people in controlled settings diets that were the same calorie count, but carbs were pushed to night. And they saw that that one difference, this group had dramatic benefits in terms of weight loss, better markers of blood inflammation, less signs of diabetes risk, uh, better depth of sleep. So it worked well in those ways on the same amount of food. And in my program, I've seen a big shift in cortisol metabolism, better weight loss, better fat loss, better depth of sleep, better energy. And those things all make sense knowing how that cortisol cycle works. So in terms of amounts, you want to think about roughly a quarter of a cup of good carbohydrate for breakfast, half a cup for lunch, and about three quarters of a cup for dinner. And this is towards the purpose of resetting cortisol rhythms. So what is a good carbohydrate? Well, your best ones for these purposes are ones that absorb slowly and have lots of fiber and even better yet, have some resistant starch. I made my shake to have a full day supply of resistant starch per even like half a serving. So that's one easy option, especially for breakfast. Other great foods include potatoes, beans and legumes, especially white beans, intact whole grains like buckwheat, and also vegetable starches like squash are nice options. But overall, good, healthy, dense carbs, high in fiber. A little bit for breakfast, a little more for lunch, a bit more for dinner. And with that, you can reset the cortisol cycle. A study I did showed that regardless of whether you're too high, too low, or backwards on your rhythm, you can head it to the right direction by about 58% within 30 days by just carb cycling. So awesome trick, huge benefits. Take great care. Dr. Christensen here with you. We'll talk again really soon. Bye-bye.